welcome you to this first of our various events to focus on the most innocent victims of Putin's war, the children. Uh, we welcome the uh, Public International Law and Policy Group, who will discuss a most important subject, and that is the prosecution of these war crimes against these most innocent victims, and with a special focus on the ones that have been kidnapped. Uh, on Sunday, last Sunday on the 15th of January, the US Ukraine Foundation announced a focused 30 day informational and advocacy uh, initiative to bring to the attention of everyone the plight of these children. There are about four and a half million children within Ukraine that have been traumatized by the war. Uh, of course, the numbers are changing. Um, nearly a thousand children have been injured, nearly 500 children killed. But I think the most depressing and shocking figure is that 14,000 children have been kidnapped and taken into enemy territory, Russia. And to date, less than 200 have been uh, re found and returned to their families. During the next 30 days and beyond probably, we will have several different discussions. We will talk to people who are engaged in helping to recover the children, what is happening. We will talk with people about the government's uh, efforts, both the Ukrainian governments and what we in the United States are doing. We will talk with groups who are working to and have programs to help these traumatized children. Uh, we also will talk about advocacy efforts within our government and within uh, our Congress. In addition, we, have, we will have an appeal to organizations that are already working tirelessly in Ukraine. We have decided that February is going to remain a very uh, tragic month for people of Ukraine. Uh, we will be commemorating shortly the one year anniversary, of course, of February the 24th. We also in February mark what we call the Heavenly Hundred. And those were the first who were killed during the Revolution of Dignity. But February has another date that is of international importance. And that's Valentine's Day. That is when people send expressions of remembering people sending love. And so we are launching a special program to send um, special remembrances and Valentines to the children of Ukraine. We in the foundation have an initiative where we have been providing food boxes. And so for the, the month of February, we will include special little gifts and things regarding in relations to Valentine's Day. So we will talk more about that later. But I am again, very honored that we are presenting this webinar as the first effort in our campaign, because I think it is perhaps the most important thing that we can do to bring the perpetrators of these crimes. You know, unlike World War II, we don't have to wait until the war ends to find out all the victims and the mass graves. We are seeing these war crimes committed in real time. And therefore these efforts by groups such as our guests here today to bring perpetrators to justice now and not wait are so very, very important. And without further ado, I will turn to Professor Milena Stereo, who will be your moderator and, the, and introduce the panel and lead the discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Milena, it's all yours. Thank you, Nadia. Hello, everybody. Thank you to all the participants who are joining us today for this roundtable discussion on prosecuting crimes in Ukraine and specifically focusing on the kidnapping of children who are being sent to Russia. My name is Milena Stereo, and I'm the managing director at the Public International Law and Policy Group and also the Charles Emmerich Jr. Calfee Halter and Griswold Professor of Law at Cleveland State University's College of Law. I will be moderating today's roundtable, and I'm honored to be guiding the conversation with these experts. This event is organized by the US-Ukraine Foundation and the Public International Law and Policy Group to raise awareness of the crimes Russia is committing in Ukraine, as well as to underscore the importance of accountability 
for those who order or commit atrocity crimes, such as the forcible transfer of Ukrainian children. The Public International Law and Policy Group is a global pro bono law firm providing free legal assistance to parties involved in peace negotiations, drafting post-conflict constitutions, war crimes prosecution, transitional justice, and human rights documentation. In today's expert roundtable, we will discuss the crimes Russia is committing in Ukraine with a specific focus on the crime of child abduction. In particular, panelists will discuss whether the Russian forces abduction of Ukrainian children and their forcible transfer to, to Russia amounts to genocide. Our esteemed panelists include Ambassador Stephen Rapp, Dr. Gregory Noon, Dean Michael Scharf, and Dr. and Professor Yvonne Dutton. We ask our audience members that you please submit any questions you have for our speakers using the Q&A function, and we will do our best to answer your questions either during the event or towards the end of the event. Now, please allow me to introduce our panelists. We're honored to welcome Ambassador Stephen Rapp, who's Senior Peace Fellow at the Public International Law and Policy Group and former U.S. Department of State's Ambassador at Large for War Crimes. Prior to his appointment, he served as prosecutor at the Special Court for Sierra Leone, where he led the prosecution of former Liberian President Charles Taylor. Prior to that, he served as Senior Trial Attorney and Chief of Prosecutions at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. I'm also thrilled to introduce Dr. Gregory Noon, Executive Director at the Public International Law and Policy Group. Dr. Noon has over 30 years of experience training senior military, governmental, and non-governmental civilian personnel in the law of armed conflict, human rights, transitional justice, and other related fields. Dr. Noon is a retired captain in the United States Navy, where he served as a judge advocate. During his distinguished career, Dr. Noon served as the head of the United States Navy's International Law Branch and has held command three times as the commanding officer of the Defense Institute of International Legal Studies Reserve Unit and the Navy JAG International and Operational Law Reserve Unit, as well as the director of the Department of Defense's Periodic Review Secretariat. Next, we welcome Dean Michael Scharf, co-founder of the Public International Law and Policy Group and co-dean of the Case Western Reserve University School of Law and also the Joseph C. Hostetler Baker Hostetler Professor of Law at Case Western Law School. Dean Sharf helped train the Iraqi judges for the trial of Saddam Hussein and has led USAID funded transitional justice projects in Uganda, Cote d'Ivoire, Libya and Turkey and maritime piracy projects in Kenya, Mauritius and the Seychelles. Dean Scharf has also served as special assistant to the prosecutor of the Cambodia Genocide Tribunal. And finally, we also welcome Professor Yvonne Dutton, senior legal advisor at the Public International Law and Policy Group and a professor of law at the Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. Professor Dutton has practiced law as federal prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, where she prosecuted organized crime and narcotics cases. She's also part of the Public International Law and Policy Group's team supporting the Ukrainian government and civil society on various questions related to international law, atrocity crimes documentation and prosecution, and transitional justice. Welcome everyone, and thank you for agreeing to participate in today's panel. Let us start by first clarifying the terms that we often see floating around in the media, and in particular, what they mean for the war in Ukraine. I will address my first question to Yvonne. Yvonne, could you please clarify for our audience what exactly are crimes against humanity and what types of acts amount to this crime? Yes, thank you, Milena, and thank you for the invitation to participate on this panel. I'll just talk briefly about crimes against humanity, which is an international crime, and it's one of the serious international crimes, one of four that are covered under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court um, and widely recognized as um, one of these very serious um, international crimes. So as defined under the Rome Statute, crimes against humanity means any of the following acts. So I'll get to the following acts, um, which we would call also the constitutive underlying acts. So any of the following acts when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack. So that's an important element. Another element directed against any civilian population. And then we have this mental state element with knowledge of the attack. So you see a few things here um, in order to qualify as a crime against humanity 
as opposed to some other crime, perhaps. Um, we need this widespread and systematic attack. So we're looking for you know, something big, um, something perhaps that's happening in various parts of a country, something that's happening um, systematically. So it's happening on some regular schedule or happening through many parts. Um, directed as a, against a civilian population, we're thinking there, we, we distinguish civilians from combatants. And I'm sure that we will talk about that more. Um, and then with knowledge of the attack means that the person, the perpetrator, the defendant who we are targeting um, is one who knows that not only is he doing the act, which we'll talk about these underlying acts in just a moment, but also knows that he's part of this bigger thing, part of this widespread and systematic attack. So I'll talk a little bit more about the underlying acts first right now. Um, they can be, so any of these acts will constitute, uh, you know, can constitute a crime against humanity if committed as part of this widespread or systematic attack directed against a civilian population with knowledge of the attack. So murder, extermination, rape, persecution. I will also mention specifically listed in the Rome statute is deportation or forcible transfer of the population also, there's this catch-all um, under crimes against humanity, this catch-all uh, uh, category that's called other inhumane acts of a similar character intentionally causing great suffering or serious injury to body or mental or physical health. Now, with that point about deportation or forcible transfer of the population, I mentioned that because of course, um, one big focus of this panel is on the forcible transfer of children, Ukrainian children to Russia. Um, and the Rome statute defines um, deportation or forcible transfer of the population as forced displacement of the persons concerned by expulsion or other coercive acts from the area in which they are lawfully present without grounds permitted under international law. So I think that's fairly self-explanatory to our audience. Um, let me say one other thing about this larger point of um, attack against a civilian population. Um, it means a course of conduct. So I mentioned that already. So we're looking for multiple commission of acts against the civilian population, generally in furtherance of some sort of state or organizational policy to commit an attack. So in this case, obviously, we are focused on Russia and Russians' acts. Um, and so we would be thinking there of, was there a state policy? And can we demonstrate a state policy? It doesn't need to be in writing. It doesn't have to be some formal policy. But can we show that through these acts or through things that were said or through witness testimony that there was obviously a policy to conduct these murders, these forcible transfers in this systematic and large scale sort of way. So I hope, um, Milena, that that sort of sets the stage for I know some of the other questions that you're gonna ask our panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I'm going to turn to Stephen Rapp. Stephen, now turning to you as the former ambassador for war crimes, we often hear in the media among lay persons that all crimes committed in Ukraine are war crimes. Can you please tell us a little bit about a, a little bit more about what exactly war crimes entail, and are war crimes different from other core international crimes? Uh, there's no question that there is evidence of a great many war crimes, a massive number of war crimes being committed in, in Ukraine, particularly by Russian forces. Uh, um, that doesn't mean that every act is a war crime. And uh, under international law, uh, in, a, in the combat that's occurring between two nations, uh, countries that shoot each other's soldiers uh, are not committing a war crime. So, but war crimes uh, are uh, in, in a conflict. Uh, uh, when there's uh, intentional uh, attacks uh, uh, or use of force or violence against uh, persons not actively engaged uh, in the hostilities, uh, then, then, then those are war crimes. And the law comes to us from the Geneva Conventions and also from the rules of customary international law of state practice of, of legitimate and beneficial practices that are that are widely recognized and, and, and also from the precedents of, of, of courts and, and international uh, tribunals. 
uh, in, in, in Ukraine under Chapter 438 of, or Section 438 of the, of the, of the Ukraine Code. Uh, of all of the war crimes uh, that are recognized under international law uh, can be prosecuted, uh, uh, certainly since that law was, was passed uh, uh, two years ago. And, uh, and then uh, in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, Article 8, uh, has in for, for, not, for international armed conflicts a comprehensive list of, of war crimes that can be prosecuted. And of course, the ICC does have jurisdiction uh, by reason of the, of the, of the second declaration uh, filed by the Ukraine government in, in 2015 and, and, and the cases before the prosecutor under the state referral of several dozen case, uh, several dozen state parties. Uh, so these war crimes uh, can be prosecuted. Now, when we talk about war crimes that are that we've seen, that we've seen evidence of, that have been in intensive news reporting, uh, you know, I often refer to there being sort of two basic types. Uh, there are these horrendous war crimes of which we saw evidence uh, after uh, the uh, Russian forces evacuated uh, from places like Busha and later from Izium, uh, uh, evidence of, of cold-blooded killings of, of civilians or of ex-combatants who were also protected, uh, and then of acts of, uh, of, of, of rape and, and, and torture and, and, and other inhumane acts uh, uh, committed, uh, which frankly are never justified in, in a conflict uh, uh, um, against uh, even during a period of active hostilities. And so uh, uh, the challenge often with those cases uh, will be, uh, you know, identifying the responsible individuals and particularly because these individuals were there uh, having not even been sure where they were being sent, uh, uh, getting to the people who sent them, who ordered them into this place. Uh, and, uh, and international law does have a variety of ways to attribute responsibility for the acts on the ground to high level actors. Uh, through things like command responsibility, under which commanders, even a political leader like Putin, can be responsible if they have actual or knowledge or should know and have failed to take action or prevent or punish. Ukraine law does not have that command responsibility feature, and so it's necessary to more uh, clearly uh, develop the, the sort of chain of command and the orders or the specific contribution of higher level uh, actors to these sort of brutal acts, which without question uh, uh, based upon the evidence that's developed that uh, could constitute war crimes. Uh, then there are the other things, the kind of things where the, the, the building with 45 civilians uh, were killed in, in Dnipro recently with shelling, the kind of thing we saw in Mariupol, and particularly the, uh, the attacks on civilian infrastructure that have been launched in massive ways uh, across Ukraine by, 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 by the Russians uh, after the, uh, the, the, you know, the partial destruction of the, of the Kirsch Bridge. And, uh, and those, uh, those uh, cases uh, are more challenging uh, because one, uh, you have to prove that they, you know, it's a crime to intentionally bombard a civ uh, civilian uh, structure uh, or infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, if it's exclusively civilian. You need to distinguish between civilian and, and military targets. On the other hand, uh, you can, uh, if you miss a civilian target, uh, that mistake is not a crime. It's not, it, it's not intentional. And so it's often challenging to prove the intentionality. Uh, there is, however, under international law, the concept of proportionality, and uh, and particularly the attacks on uh, Russian or by the Russians against the uh, civilian infrastructure, against uh, uh, electricity uh, production and distribution, and and, and water supply in, in the cold months of winter, uh, seems to be directly an attack to punish the civilian population, and uh, and it seems disproportionate dramatically disproportionate to any effect on the battlefield. It doesn't have any real effect uh, on what's happening in Kyrgyzstan or Bakhmut or, or elsewhere. And so I think in this area, uh, uh, there may be soon action by the ICC against high level individuals, because that clearly is orders coming from the highest level. They're not individual renegade soldiers uh, doing something that may be denied. Uh, these are from the highest level and announced. And so in that area, we may see a prosecution, uh, even of Putin uh, by, the, by the ICC. Uh, here today, we're talking about another crime that uh, is, is sort of a mix of, of the two, because this clearly is, is state policy of being uh, being uh, uh, implemented at the highest level with Putin himself and this, and this woman who heads this uh, agency uh, uh, being, uh, you know, in the public media describing what they're doing uh, in, in some kind of as, as some kind of humanitarian act. It reminds me a little of attitudes in the past where people would remove uh, children from uh, from Indian reservations or indigenous and, and take them away from their families saying we're, we're, we're rescuing them from, from savages or something. And we and the countries that have done that have come to recognize that as, as genocide. Uh, 
And indeed, when you those acts didn't include adoption, here you're talking about adoption, and, and there we have explicit provisions in the Genocide Convention, which we'll talk about in, in a little bit. But uh, let me just talk about uh, the war crimes and, and what, what this is in the context of war crimes. The uh, international humanitarian law, uh, the, the law that basically is what, we're, what war crimes are all about, uh, is set forth in the Geneva Conventions and its additional protocol, whether or not Russia has ratified additional protocol one uh, uh, to the convention, the International Court of Justice has recognized it as part of customary international law. And, and, and explicitly in Article 78 of additional protocol one, it has a whole policy and what is lawful in terms of children. And it says no party uh, shall arrange for the evacuation of children other than its own nationals to a foreign country. Uh, and for a temporary evacuation, uh, that has to be done for, for medical treatment uh, uh, or reasons of health, and, and not even for reasons of safety if the person's occupied, uh, uh, removed from an from a, uh, occupied territory. And, and then there needs to be consent of the parent or guardian, uh, and if they're not available, uh, consent of some other person uh, having uh, that, the, the right to do so. And then there's supposed to be a process of facilitating of the return of those children and the sharing of identification of, uh, and, and pictures of the child uh, with the international committees of the Red Cross. None of this is, 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 is happening. And then if you look at the ICC statute, uh, specifically the statute in 82A7 uh, uh, says that the, the forcible deportation, which this is across an, an international border or transfer even within a country that is unlawful, this makes it unlawful, it's a crime. So we have a prosecutable crime of a forced deportation because of what's unlawfully being done under the under the laws of uh, the provided in the Geneva Conventions and under customary international law, uh, uh, as far as these children are concerned. And uh, and frankly, I think this may be one of the first cases uh, that the, that the ICC deals with and and uh, with potential prosecutions of high level individuals because this isn't a situation, as I say, of renegades doing it or being able to say that renegades are doing it. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a situation in which uh, the actual actors uh, are stating publicly uh, what, what they're doing involved in, you know, in this displacement of 14,000 children. And, and their attitude uh, is, uh, is, is a criminal one, uh, given uh, no, no matter what they may think in terms of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, Russia and Ukraine and everything else, uh, uh, this is not uh, anything but a crime under international law uh, on which there's abundant evidence. Thank you. Now, before we continue with my questions, there's actually an excellent question that just came in through the Q&A feature. So let me ask this question and I'll invite our panelists to answer, um, you know, you can just you can just kind of wave your hand at me. I will call on you. So here's the question: regarding the differences in national Ukrainian legislation and the norms of international treaties, wouldn't you be able to claim that international law, international treaties, as well as customary international law, are part and parcel of Ukrainian law, since the former are to be considered incorporated into national law? And I think this in particular um, uh, has come into um, you know, consideration when we think about prosecuting some of these crimes under Ukrainian national law. And as most of our audience members probably know, there's this principle of non-retroactive application of, of criminal law. So Michael, I see you have your hand up. All right, so big picture, there are three kinds of countries. There are dualists, which are countries like the UK where international law does not have an effect domestically in the, unless there's a piece of legislation that imports international law and that's what controls. There are monist countries like Germany where international law under its constitution is automatically the law of Germany and they don't need any legislation to make that effective. And then there are a lot of things in between that are hybrid countries like the United States. And I think to some extent, Ukraine is a hybrid country. And this is why I say that. We've done some work looking at the Ukrainian domestic legislation on crimes against humanity and on the crime of aggression. And there are differences in how it is worded compared to the international law standards that are articulated in the International Criminal Court's Rome Statute. In addition to the substantive crimes, there's also differences in the modes of liability. 
And the question that has come up is, would the Ukrainian courts be able to apply the international standards, even if they are deviating from the domestic standards? And it's even more difficult because there are provisions in the Ukrainian law that make it very difficult to change law during times of armed conflict. And so this has become a challenge to us. And I can tell you that we've consulted a lot of experts and there's a lot of ambiguity about exactly how the Ukraine would treat the differences between how these laws, uh, these international laws are defined domestically and internationally. I do want to jump in, though, that, that when it comes to war crimes, we do have this Article 438, which seems rather definitely to have adopted the whole program of, 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 of conventional and customary international law. Of course, it has, uh, you know, it's very short and, and it requires uh, Ukrainian judges to go to that law and apply it, et cetera. So it's not written down the way the Rome statute is rather rather clearly. So I think we have less problem and that's where the case has thus far have been filed and uh, both in person and in absentia in the Ukrainian uh, system is on war crimes. But bringing in crimes against humanity when it's not even mentioned is, is challenging and it's why most of us recommend that Ukraine, whenever it can, uh, uh, adopt a statute that explicitly provides that. And of course the aggression is challenging already because we'll we'll hear about that. Uh, but obviously, there's a difficulty with one state prosecuting the leaders of another under international law. But uh, but anyway, that's uh, enough on that. At least on war crimes, I think we've got the tools that we need. Thank you, absolutely. And actually, you mentioned aggression. That is going to be my next question. I was going to direct it at Michael, but um, Stephen or any other panelist, if you want to jump in, um, you can do so at any time. Michael, tell us about the crime of aggression. What is the crime of aggression, and can the crime crime uh, can the crime of aggression be uh, prosecuted? Okay, so the crime of aggression was really invented at Nuremberg, and it was negotiated and put into the Nuremberg. Uh, charter so that they could prosecute the Nazi leaders for waging an aggressive war. And it was defined in the Nuremberg judgments and in the charter, basically of unprovoked attacks against neighboring countries where you don't have self-defense or another rationale. When the UN charter was negotiated at the same time as the Nuremberg Charter, they created Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter, which says one country cannot attack another. And they have one exception written in in Article 51 for self-defense and another exception written in in Chapter 7 for authorized actions by the UN Security Council. And for the next 75 years, those were the only two exceptions that were recognized to the rule that one country cannot attack another country. And when you do that, uh, there are General Assembly resolutions and now a definition in the Rome Statute that gives you the elements of what makes one of these unauthorized and unprovoked attacks the crime of aggression. So that crime has now been codified. And it, I think it's been widely recognized that this codification represents customary international law. There's the ability for countries to prosecute international crimes under what's known as universal jurisdiction. And they can also prosecute international crimes when they occur in their territory. And so currently there is a discussion about whether the crime of aggression can be prosecuted in the Ukraine, which has a statute on its books defining that crime. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a slightly different definition than the ICC definition, but it's the general same crime. Could this crime of aggression be prosecuted in European countries under universal jurisdiction? Or could there be an international tribunal or a hybrid tribunal created to prosecute the crime of aggression? Now, Steve alluded to this big problem with the crime of aggression. It's a leadership crime. The people you wanna focus on are the top people. When it comes to the president of a country or the prime minister or the foreign minister of a country, there is an international court of justice case. It's the Belgium arrest warrant case. It involved the Congolese foreign minister named Euridia. And the international court of justice said that there is head of state immunity for heads of state, including presidents and foreign ministers 
while they are in office, even for crimes against humanity. And I assume that that would also apply to the crime of aggression. So this particular ICJ decision is going to make it hard for the Ukraine or any other country to prosecute these international leaders at the top level. But in that same ICJ case, the world court said that this would not apply to prosecutions by international tribunals, and it specifically referred to the International Criminal Court. Now, a couple of years later, the special court for Sierra Leone, where Stephen Rapp was the chief prosecutor, had a case that went all the way up to their appeals chamber. And the question was, if they wanted to prosecute Charles Taylor, who had been the head of state of, of uh, Liberia, for his aiding and abetting of attacks in Sierra Leone and war crimes in Sierra Leone, did he have head of state immunity? And the question was posed as, was the special court for Sierra Leone, a hybrid tribunal, international enough to be of the type that the International Court of Justice said does not have a problem with head of state immunity. And the court looked, and the appeals chamber looked at the fact that there was a majority of international or foreign judges and a minority of Sierra Leone judges. There had been an international prosecutor. There had been an agreement with the United Nations. And for all of those reasons, they said, this is international enough, head of state immunity doesn't apply, Charles Taylor was prosecuted, convicted, and he's spending time in jail in the United Kingdom. So the question then is, you know, if there was a hybrid tribunal, would it be international enough that it would fit within this precedent? And I think that one created, like the Special Court for Sierra Leone, with an agreement with the United Nations and provided that there is a majority of international uh, judges and an international prosecutor, no problem. But there are proposals that the European countries or that just a couple of like-minded states create such a tribunal. And there, it's not absolutely clear whether the it would fit into the, um, the Euridia and the Special Court for Sierra Leone's precedent or whether it would present problems with head of state immunity. There needs to be one thing added here, of course, on the International Criminal Court and, and having been involved at Kampala, we won't necessarily get into why it happened. But the ICC uh, only gained jurisdiction for, for the crime of aggression in 2018 under an amendment. And under the provisions that were negotiated with consensus in Kampala when that amendment was adopted, uh, it really only applies uh, to the citizens of states that have ratified the Rome Statute and that amendment, which is now only 37 states, which don't include Russia, don't include Ukraine. And so it can't, the ICC can be used for the genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity allegation, if there are sufficiently grave cases to go to the ICC and be prosecuted, aggression is not available. The only exception to that is the ICC can always take a case after that's arisen after 2002 uh, if the Security Council votes uh, uh, to refer it, as it did uh, Darfur and Sudan uh, and later Libya. Uh, but that's, of course, subject to veto, and Russia would, of course, uh, veto it. So the ICC is not available here. And if you want to do aggression, you will need to basically negotiate a, a new court. But it could then retroactively, under the kind of things that we've done in these tribunals, uh, apply the international law that exists as a matter of custom uh, out there and, and under the uh, UN general, uh, under the UN's uh, uh, charter, uh, Article 2.4, uh, to, uh, uh, to the case of Ukraine. And given the precedent in Sierra Leone, uh, prosecuted the top leaders even while still in office. Thank you. And just a follow up question for Michael, and then we will move on to um, I did want to also discuss genocide. I have a question for Greg waiting, but I did want to follow up with Michael. Michael, you talked about immunity, head of state immunity. Um, how many states in the General Assembly would you need? Uh, you know, would, would you need an overwhelmingly accepted resolution? Would you need, you know, 160 states in the General Assembly to make sure that you are demonstrating how there is consensus towards this um, Ukraine hybrid tribunal? Would that be enough to overcome head of state immunity? Or do you think a simple majority of states in the UN General Assembly would be enough? There is there is no this is this is this is where I, th I think we're in the gray area to some extent. I don't think there is a there's a right or wrong answer. But what, what do you think? Well, First of all, 
Since February 24th, the um, General Assembly has invoked the Uniting for Peace mechanism. And it has now been used five times by the General Assembly since then for the situation in the Ukraine. Um, what this mechanism does is when the Security Council is paralyzed, the General Assembly, ever since it was first used in 1950, has the power to have a special emergency session and by a two thirds vote, they can pass resolutions that would otherwise be seen as things that normally would be the prerogative of the UN Security Council. So already they've passed resolutions condemning the aggression and this resolution has been already referred to in an International Court of Justice case involving uh, Russia and the Ukraine. And they've passed resolutions that have said that the plebiscites in uh, the Donbass, Eastern Ukraine region are invalid. They've passed a resolution setting up a special apparatus so that people can file um, their claims that their property has been destroyed or taken from them during the war. And they are inching toward other kinds of actions. I, I would predict as things get worse and worse, you'll see resolutions establishing sanctions. There is the possibility, um, Stephen, that there might even be a proposal to strip the Russians of their Security Council status so they can't veto things. And that could happen two different ways. One, they could go back to what happened when Russia assumed the Soviet Union's seat. And that was a very confused time and the legal rationale was very stretched at the time. And even though it's now been 30 years, you could try to reopen that. Or using the South Africa precedent, you could say Russia has been such a horrible violator of the basic tenets of the UN Charter that they should not have their credentials recognized until they come into compliance. And that was done to South Africa through the General Assembly, um, and it, it kept them out of the United Nations for several years until the fall of apartheid. Th those are possibilities. But short of that, what I believe will happen is that the General Assembly will look at a proposal to create an ad hoc tribunal, and it will go through the Uniting for Peace process. So it'll take a two thirds vote. I think if it's a two thirds vote and if it complies with the process, there isn't going to be a question that it is somehow ultra virus or not enough states to be international enough. And let me just add in, in terms of the, of the progress on this thing yesterday, the, the European Parliament and, uh, voted 472 to, uh, to 19, uh, 472 yes, 19 no, uh, 33 abstention in favor of the establishment of such a, a, such a special tribunal. Now, as, as I understand the Ukrainian government's position, and I was on a call with uh, the head of the presidential office, Yarmak, uh, with some internationals uh, in uh, uh, about a month and a half ago, and uh, there is remains concern about the votes in the global south and in other uh, parts of the world. Now, the, the, the vote on, uh, on the annexation, the vote on the aggression, we had votes of 140, 142, 141, uh, with a dozen or so uh, a negative and, and other abstentions and non-voting. On the claims issue, I think it was 90 something to 24. Understand two thirds is two thirds of those voting yes or no. So I mean, a resolution could go through uh, 80 to 35 with 60, uh, uh, 60 70 abstentions, and, and that would qualify under, under United for Peace. But, uh, but obviously the, uh, it's important and, uh, to build the support for this. Uh, in the General Assembly, and it would then, if a resolution occurred, it would be the Secretary General who would negotiate uh, with the government of Ukraine, and Ukraine would basically put its jurisdiction uh, uh, for the crime of aggression that it has over its territory into that court, and then there would be a, a statute to story provisions as to where the judges would come from and how it, uh, how it would operate. It's important to note that there, there is now work toward the establishment of what's called an interim prosecutor's office uh, agreement between the Netherlands and, uh, and Ukraine uh, to establish such an office to begin working on uh, the investigation, the development of evidence, uh, the framing of an indictment, uh, and, and, and that being done under an international agreement. Now, on the other hand, once a court is established, 
that court would have a prosecutor who might decide to do things differently. But it's viewed that this interim office could get it a head start and help build the momentum and lay out uh, what the evidence was and why there's such a critical need that this, uh, as people referred to it at Nuremberg's, the judges called it the supreme international crime that uh, contains the accumulated evil of the whole. And, and if one thinks about Ukraine and, and what happened on February 24th, peaceful people going to school, work, everything else, and then death starts raining from the sky, having done nothing uh, to provoke Russia other than becoming, you know, a functional democracy. And, and so, you know, you have a, uh, this this outrage, which is, I think, uh, if, we, if we don't prosecute that, if we're simply dealing with the facts of which acts in the, in the battlefield and elsewhere were war crimes, we're not encompassing the evil of the whole, and we're not encompassing, you know, uh, the deaths and the injury to you know, families when their, uh, you know, sons and brothers are, are off uh, uh, fighting and dying in, in, in the trenches in the Donbass. Those are victims too, not of war crimes, because they're combatants, but they are victims of aggression. Now we have, thank you so much for, for those remarks. We have talked about three of the core crimes. We have talked about war crimes, we have talked about crimes against humanity, and we have talked about aggression. We have not yet talked about genocide. So my next question is for Greg. Greg, a crime that has been discussed internationally regarding the situation in Ukraine is genocide. Some experts and politicians have declared the situation in Ukraine a genocide while others have shied away from labeling some of the crimes as genocide. Why is there such controversy surrounding genocide? And can you also discuss and tell our audience members a little bit more as to why it is important to use precise terminology when speaking about the war in Ukraine? Great. Thank you, Milena. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so two great points. One is the controversy and two is precision. Uh, the controversy uh, really lies in the fact that the Genocide Convention is actually the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the crime of genocide. So there's uh, there's a a a uh, arguably a sense that there's an obligation to act if you say that it is a genocide genocide. So some states shy away from that because it's really unclear as to what that obligation entails. Um, the, the U.S. did this during the Rwandan genocide, where they where they kind of fiddled around with what acts of genocide were being committed, and so people kind of shy away from that. Um, uh, for fear of obligation. An another thing that causes people to shy away from it a little bit is because this is really the quintessential crime against humanity. And, uh, you know, if you, if you call everything a genocide, then nothing's a genocide. So they want to be very precise, which leads me to the second part of your question on what that means. So a, a, a genocide is the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. And these are the acts that you do it by either killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm uh, to members of the group, uh, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and lastly, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And, I, and we'll talk more about that in, in the coming uh, questions here in a few moments. Um, so it's a specific intent crime that you must prove that the targeted group is based on their nationality, their ethnicity, their race, or their religion. And so that's why it's much uh, more of a, of a higher burden to prove uh, when we start looking at talking about cases and what forms and things like that. Crimes against humanity, another significant crime that Yvonne talked about a minute ago, but much wider aperture to be able to grab people who may have done bad things out there uh, to, the, to the civilian population. Thank you. Now, before we go on with um, my questions, I see that there are several other excellent questions that have come in through um, the Q&A feature here. So let me turn to some of those. Um, there's a question raised about universal 
jurisdiction. So I did want to ask all of you what you thought were the possibilities of prosecuting some of these crimes under the relevant universal ju jurisdiction laws of different countries. The question asked about you know, EU countries, European countries, but presumably uh, any other country that has universal jurisdiction laws could, could possibly prosecute. So what do you think about that option? And then in, in particular, how do you think that universal jurisdiction, domestic level, universal jurisdiction based proceedings how would that influence the work of the ICC? How would, how would you know, imagine a situation where we had two sets of proceedings. There's a national court prosecuting under universal jurisdiction, and then obviously there's also the ICC investigation. So I know that's a, that's a very compound and complex question, but would anybody like to, to, to tackle it? Well, let me just jump in. Uh, I mean, we're, in cases out of Syria, for instance, the only forum at the moment is, is universal jurisdiction cases in Germany, for instance. Uh, and there is, um, but obviously in this situation, you have the other forum of, 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 of Ukraine and also the ICC, at least for these war crimes, crimes against humanity and, 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 and genocide. Uh, the Germans have already opened a structural investigation. They have broad universal jurisdiction. They can prosecute if it, basically there's a German interest and they have some of the surviving victims, including children of, a, of an attack near Odessa, a, a bombing uh, in Germany, and they have availability of witnesses. So they are actually proceeding and, and may in the near future indict uh, individuals. Now they're looking for those that might be in Germany. There are probably not a lot of those at the, at, at the moment, uh, though they can reach out as they've done in the Syrian context and, and indict uh, high level people, but not necessarily, they, they, they're still under the arrest warrant case, they can't indict uh, Putin. There are a number of other cases that, uh, uh, that are coming in not so much from universal jurisdiction, from what we call but what we call passive personality jurisdiction, countries uh, whose dual nationals, who are Ukrainian and French or Canadian or U.S. etc., ha have been uh, have been killed or or injured in some other way uh, during the conflict thus far, and and those states have jurisdiction uh, to to prosecute uh, those cases, and uh, there are uh, efforts uh, in a variety of countries underway to 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 build cases. Now, that is, is that a duplicative or something the ICC is not, sh it shouldn't happen? No, I mean, the ICC has never prosecuted more than six people in, in any of its situations. Uh, and, uh, and then it quickly got down to three in that one. Uh, so it, it, they are not going to prosecute uh, that many individuals. And so having universal jurisdiction, particularly to catch uh, enablers, uh, you know, those oligarchs who might be under an assumed name and parking their yacht next door, you know, some of those people, uh, it's quite appropriate that they uh, that they go after them. And that, frankly, people that have committed these crimes um, 40 years from now, uh, maybe somewhere, and uh, and they can get it uh, uh, charged just as, as we've seen that happening with Nazis or people involved in in, in crimes and torture in Latin America or, or, or elsewhere. I mean, and it's an important part of sending a signal that if you commit crimes like these, there is no rest in this life uh, and that there, you can't really go anywhere, uh, um, you know, with that, unless you're in the, in, you know, in, the, in, in some hideaway in the, in the bad country without any ability to get to, uh, anybody to get to you. Uh, but, you know, you, you, it's important to send that message. So this will be a key part of achieving a justice, uh, not the major part, but an important one. Thank you. Now, I did want to get to this more specific issue of the crime of the forcible abduction of children, the children who have been kidnapped, abducted from Ukraine and taken to Russia. Um, Michael, how do you, you know, how would you prosecute this crime? Is this a crime against humanity? Is this genocide? How would you prosecute the crime of the abduction of children and their forcible transfer to Russia? Okay, so first of all, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I predict that you will see among the first indictments coming out of the International Criminal Court, those focused on this crime, and I don't think it will be too much longer in the future. So, you know, put your seatbelts on, hang on, we're going to see a bumpy ride on this. Um, you know, I think Stephen explained that if you are taking... And, and targeting and, and removing children um, during a time of war, um, it is a war crime and, and you can't justify it by saying you're trying to just bring them to a safe zone, which is an exception built into the Geneva Conventions. Under these circumstances, that doesn't apply. 
And, and Greg was very good at explaining that the, the Genocide Convention has a clause written in that says the forcible removal of children, that's um, Article 2E, is one of those acts of genocide. Now, I think the, the difficulty in genocide is that usually you think of genocide as the destruction of a group in part, substantial part, or in total. And what we have heard is that there are uh, 14,000 kidnapped kids, um, 200 have been found. So 14,000, that's, that's a lot. And that's a crime against humanity, that's a war crime. Is it enough for genocide? And I think that you can look at genocide in terms of different regions of a country. So if we're talking about the Eastern part of Ukraine and a large number of children have been kidnapped from those occupied territories and sent to Russia and then tried to transform them into Russians, that's a genocide in that region. You don't have to look at all the Ukrainians, you know, like what percentage of um, all the Ukrainian children is 14,000 and it's a very small percent. Um, so that's one way that you might go about trying to prosecute that crime with genocide. And I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. When they were negotiating the Genocide Convention, there were discussions about the US and Canadian treatment of Native Americans. And in particular, the fact that the US and Canada were doing this very thing. We were taking children from Native Americans and we were having them forcibly uh, uh, adopted by non-Native American families. And there was also discussion that this was going on to the Aborigines in Australia. And one of the things about the Genocide Convention is it's not retroactive so that the US, Canada and Australia cannot be prosecuted for genocide for those things for the very reason that they felt that those actually would have constituted genocide or may have. And I think that this is the modern incarnation of that practice. And it's been a long time since a country has brazenly kidnapped thousands of people from one ethnic group or one nationality transferred them to another and had them adopted and tried to erase their heritage the way the Russians are. I, I think that does constitute genocide. So I'd go after them for genocide. The easier ones, as I said, are you know going after them for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now, let, let me turn to Yvonne and ask a similar question. Um, when looking at the elements of genocide, Forceful transfer of children from one group to another does fulfill one of the elements for uh, essentially being able to label some of these acts as, as, as genocide, or at least it looks like that when you read the definition. Um, so th does it mean that these acts necessarily amount to genocide? What are your thoughts on, on you know, actually being able to prosecute these acts as genocide? Thanks. Yeah, I think Michael um, alluded to a lot of this already. When one talks again, and this is going back to what Greg talked about too, for in order to prove the crime of genocide beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So that's what the prosecutor has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, we do have to prove this specific intent to destroy in whole or in part let's just say Ukrainians, right? As a national group, I'll just, I'll just say that for the purposes of this discussion that we're having. And now that can be done through the forcible transfer of children um, to another group. In this case, the forcible the transfer of Ukrainian children to Russia. And we know that that can constitute um, genocide. The, the International Court of Justice has noted that the forcible transfer of children can you know lead to the destruction of the group, right? We can we can see it as such because it has these um, consequences for the group's capacity to renew itself and hence to ensure its long-term survival. Um, and the ICJ said something to the effect of the transfer and assimilation of children into a new group can result in the erasure of their identity as members of the protected group and consequently threaten the future existence of the protected group. The genocide convention that, that both Greg and Michael referred to also noted that the inclusion of the forcible child transfer clause in the genocide convention was connected with the vulnerability of children, um, their dependence, futurity, and malleability, 
as well as the destructive consequences of this practice on the viability of the group's survival. So absolutely could constitute um, genocide. The difficulty, as, as has been alluded to, is proving that the purpose of that forcible transfer was to destroy Ukrainians, right? Now, this can be proven. Um, one would often look to statements that are made um, by you know, leadership. And I think it was, um, it might've been Stephen who alluded to, um, Putin has made many statements um, as he launched this invasion and thereafter talking about, you know, there is no new Ukraine, this is all Russia, things like that. So statements like that could be used to suggest um, that all of the acts being done by Russians, um, including the forcible transfer of children, were with the intent to eliminate um, Ukraine and Ukrainians and Ukrainian culture as a separate um, nationality. Um, I think Stephen also alluded to um, statements by um, the Kremlin and, and this woman um, who is part of this, this one group in Ukraine talking about the adoptions talk, you know, sort of bragging about the fact that these adoptions are happening, um, sort of suggesting that these, these children are being made into Russians. I think all of that would be helpful evidence towards proving uh, a specific intent to destroy. One can also use circumstantial evidence, and one, I think, need not only consider um, the forcible transfer of children. Remember, this is taking part in a larger context, right? We can see all of the other actions that Russia is doing, you know, destroying cities and infrastructure and, and killing civilians in mass quantities, um, transferring other, you know, uh, as I understand it, transferring women. All sorts of things are being done. And all of that, I think, can help circumstantially prove this larger context of an intent to destroy. With all of that said, and I think Greg alluded to this, the thinking is genocide is the crime of all crimes. You know, many, many people would suggest as much. And so there's this feeling that, you know, as Greg mentioned, it should not be used in every case. And I'm not suggesting that this is not the case where it should be used. This, this very well might be the case where this, where genocide is the appropriate terminology. Um, but it's looked at very carefully for that reason, right? We don't want to call everything a genocide. So we want to be very careful. And, and it's been written such that there is this very difficult prosecutorial mental state um, hurdle to cross in order to prove it. So I'll leave it there. And you know, others might want to jump in here as well. I had one other wrinkle to this. Absolutely. The, the Genocide Convention includes in Article 3D, the crime of attempt to commit genocide. So in order to prosecute genocide, you don't have to prove that it was successfully completed, that there were thousands and thousands of people killed. You can you can prove if you if you have the kind of intent, circumstantial evidence that Yvonne was referring to, you could prove that this was the beginning of a genocide and that therefore it was an attempt at genocide. Thank you for the clarification, Michael. Um, there is a, there are a couple of questions from the um, chat from the Q and A that that are directly relevant to this. So let me let me turn to those. So one has one one goes as follows: What options does Ukraine have internationally to return some of the children who have been deported? And then the second question asks us about the forcible suppression of the use of the Ukrainian language, and would this act? amount fit within the definition of genocide. So on this question of, you know, we're, we oftentimes focus on accountability and prosecutions, and obviously those are very, very important for Ukrainian authorities to be able to return some of these children. Greg? Yeah, well, th th this is a tough one, no, no question about it. And the reality of it is in past armed conflicts, in the uh, peace deal, armistice, ceasefire, whatever whatever category the end falls under, um, usually there is a requirement to repatriate everybody that has crossed over a border. 
and 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 sometimes that repatriation is good if we're talking about children and uh, as Yvonne mentioned other civilians that have gone through these filtration you know centers and and moved into Russia and sometimes it's less satisfying because at, for instance at the end of the Korean War uh, technically not ended but at the armistice of the Korean War everyone had to be returned even if there are war crimes charges pending so that was that was one of the sticking points. We had over 850 charges being ready to, to be proffered at the end of the Korean War, and we had to return all those soldiers back to back to North Korea. So that's where I would see this idea that we're going to move people from you know this side of the border to the other side of the border. To talk about enforcement, obviously, you know, we already had the, the case that was filed by Ukraine against Russia under the Genocide Convention which was uh, uh, because of uh, Putin's justification that he was invading in order to prevent a genocide. And of course, uh, that, that was in, in, in at least its uh, you know, provisional measures uh, won by, by Ukraine. I mean, there's a discussion of a, of a more affirmative case against Russia for, uh, uh, for genocide, uh, which Ukraine can. They, both countries have ratified it. And in fact, because Ukraine, if you remember, uh, was uh, was sort of a quasi-independent country, even under the Soviet Union, uh, and one of the three members of the Soviet uh, Union or the Union uh, that were part of the UN. And so uh, they have the ability to uh, sue each other uh, in the ICJ. And so there could be a, a, a request for preliminary measures in regard or pr provisional measures to bring the children back. Now, obviously, enforcing that is very difficult because you have to go to the Security Council to enforce it, and Russia would veto it. So it doesn't it it, it doesn't uh, get you. Uh, very far. Now, of course, the ICRC uh, is to be involved there. They, of course, don't do the International Committee of the Red Cross. And uh, of course, they rarely speak publicly. And some people are disappointed uh, by their <laughs> relative reticence uh, in this situation. Uh, but uh, they uh, have access to, to both sides. And and they should be uh, uh, working to facilitate the return of these, of these children. And, and they're supposed to be receiving identification uh, information on each of these uh, children under the Geneva Conventions. I don't think they are. But, but obviously, there should be a more active effort uh, to, to really press them uh, to do this <laughs> and, to, uh, and to report on whether it's possible, to be frank. Uh, they don't really don't want to um, take sides and lose access. But I think this is a situation uh, where something is happening uh, where uh, where they really do need to speak out and be more affirmative. Of course, they they, they suffer for, for 75 years from having gone to a concentration camp and not having said anything about what the Nazis are doing. And so uh, I, I think the uh, that organization, uh, uh, important as access is, uh, needs to be more active publicly on this front. Now, what about to to all the panelists again? This issue of the basically forceful suppression of the Ukrainian language can, can that be one of the you know factors or under even underlying acts in in um, determining whether there has been a genocide committed? Can be can that be a genocidal act? Michael. Yeah. So when you talk about destroying a group. Um, there are many different ways you can destroy a group. Um, in the context of Cambodia, there was discussion about, well, if they targeted all the religious leaders, that would destroy that religious group, even though you weren't killing the group itself. Well, if you are somehow able to completely destroy a language, to suppress a language, and you have thereby transformed the group. There are no longer Ukrainians because nobody speaks that language anymore. That seems to me to be one element of proving a genocide case, and it, it would be significant. Thank you. It's important to note, however, and I don't want to be the, the cold water uh, person, but you know, it's not the cultural genocide. Uh, we have to talk about the physical uh, destruction of of the group, and uh, and and that's uh, a, a challenge. And 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 any case that relies uh, solely on genocide as the count runs the risk of of losing on some of this sort of physical destruction thing. Obviously, the adoption actually does work. Uh, over time, the physical destruction of, of the group. Um, uh, of course, <laughs> if, this, if you forced everyone to speak a language and to change their nationality and did that with force, uh, you may you, you may get there as as well, but it's not as explicit. Uh, 
as uh, as as things like that, that actually affect the young and that that work uh, a transition from one ethnic group to another. So um, you know it it is challenging to use genocide as as the main charge here, but uh, but it fits. Uh, and and I and I, if I were a prosecutor, I'd be in, in, including it amongst uh, together with war crimes and crimes against humanity uh, on these uh, forcible adoption cases. So actually, Stephen, let me go back to you with with a follow up question on this. Um, wearing your prosecutorial hat, you know, you were you were the prosecutor at the special court for Sierra Leone. When deciding how to charge some of the crimes, how do you go about deciding whether to charge some of these underlying acts as genocide or, for example, as a crime against humanity? You know, it could be a war crime also, but, but let's just talk about um, how you decide. Because on the one hand, there's this pull to sort of go after the genocide conviction because at least you know, there's a perception of genocide as being the most heinous crime. But on the other hand, you might have significant evidentiary challenges. And as prosecutor, I think most prosecutors would agree that proving the crime of genocide is more difficult than proving crimes against humanity or war crimes. So how do you go about making those decisions? Basically, as, as a prosecutor, you decide, uh, you know, based upon a fair evaluation of the evidence in front of you, whether you have a provable case uh, and, uh, and and you can proceed. Uh, you know, there are always an approach to present the strongest case. Uh, and, and uh, you know, my own uh, philosophy of this, like in the Special Court for Sierra Leone, is uh, if you were dealing with particular conduct, you'd want to have a very strong case on it. Uh, but then you might uh, want to, uh, where, where the law was perhaps more ambiguous, maybe try to develop some law uh, where you uh, where you think you have a, a very strong legal argument and you have the evidence under that legal argument, you can go ahead. The way we in Sierra Leone, for instance, uh, dealt with uh, what many people refer to as, as sexual slavery, uh, the forced marriage phenomenon of women being uh, forcibly uh, uh, required to provide sexual favors and enslaved within an armed group. Uh, uh, that was without question the crime against humanity of sexual slavery, but we also said this could be a forced marriage beyond the, the sexual acts, the various ways in which these women were conscripted into the conjugal relation and were in fact then stigmatized, essentially the consort of these folks, and then they couldn't even go home. And so we charged that as another inhumane act, and people said, well, is that is that not? But we eventually won that after whilst it in one case, we won it finally on appeal. And so uh, you do do things like that, uh, and in in order to help make the law and and send a and send a message. But you only uh, you only do it when you've got a really solid foundation on being able to convict on something. So, Melena, if if I were a prosecutor, I'd be tempted to bring charges on all the possible crimes at the same time. In the alternative, and at the end of the day, whatever crime stuck, you still have a criminal who's been proven to have done horrible things, who's now in jail. But I would be tempted to do that except for looking at history. The um, Slobodan Milosevic case, I think taught us a lesson that when you have really big crime bases and you are prosecuting in the alternative and it takes three or four years, therefore, to make your case, things happen in three or four years. Witnesses disappear um, in the Milosevic case, a judge died and they didn't have an alternate judge. They had to bring one in halfway through the trial. And then Slobodan Milosevic died before the ultimate verdict, thereby erasing judicial history from being made. So um, the lesson, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth pretty wildly. When they got to the Saddam Hussein trial, they said, hey, let's not make that mistake. Let's just prosecute him for one particular crime that we have really, really solid evidence for. But that was criticized because you failed to tell the whole story of what happened. And so I think it's it's wonderful to have Stephen here because he gives us a, a dose of reality. But these are really tough decisions to make because of these different kinds of consequences. Thank you. And actually, Yvonne, yes, Yvonne, I was going to ask you, um, you know, this and then also, again, I, you were you were a federal prosecutor. So what are some, if you can tell us a little bit more about some of the evidentiary challenges involved in successfully prosecuting these cases? Yeah, and I think just going to sort of building on Stephen and Michael, as a former prosecutor, you know, at the federal U.S. level, I, I think it's absolutely right. You have to decide, do I think I have the evidence to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt? And I think that includes 
thinking about, especially with genocide, the difficulty of proving specific intent, you know, how good is my evidence on specific intent? And then remember with specific intent to destroy a problem, what the defense can bring up is dual motives or other motives for why they did what they did, right? Um, and so if they can come up with other logical reasons, you know, that might be convincing, right, that we didn't do that to destroy, that we had a military objective. Now, that's tough to come up with for forcibly transferring children, but that could be used in other situations, right? So when I am thinking about proving a case as a prosecutor, I'm not just thinking about what good evidence do I have, but I'm also trying to think of what defenses might be raised. And even if I might think that they're nonsense, you know, I have to be thinking, well, how well might they sell with whatever, my, whoever my audience is? And I have to take that into account. I think as a person considering whether to bring a genocide charge, I think that's made even more difficult by the fact that there's probably a lot of people rooting for the genocide charge. And we've seen that in the case of Ukraine, right? There's, there's definitely a feeling that that is what, what has happened. And there's obviously a very strong feeling about these children, right? And taking vulnerable children obviously um, is something that, that sort of pulls at all of us, right? That, that's something we all feel horrible about that. And we want to do something about that. And to label it as genocide is certainly something a lot of people want that symbolic genocide conviction. But then there's the risk. If I, if I bring the genocide charges and I am unable to successfully convict of the genocide charges, have I done more harm than good, right? So I would have, I would be thinking about that as well with respect to the genocide charges, in addition to all of the other things that Stephen and I think Michael have mentioned. Uh, Nadia, it sounds like you would like to jump in. Un unmute. I'm not an attorney, so I come at this obviously from just being engaged in these issues for decades. You know, I fully appreciate that the world is now being confronted with this in real time. You know, it's, and I mentioned, you know, we don't have to wait till the end of the fighting to discover the mass graves and everything that's been going on. We're seeing it directly and we, and we're not, and we don't have to wait for reports necessarily, right? It's, we're seeing it on television certainly appreciate the challenges that the international world has in confronting this evil in real time. Excuse me, but from what I've heard today from all of you, you have clearly identified the uh, definitions of what constitute a, a genocide. Uh, you know, words, you know, Putin and his, you know, have told us directly what their intent is. What is the point of having this genocide charge if we're not going to exercise this? What message does it send to future, you know, dictators that they will not be, you know, they will escape because, because it, it is tough? If not now, if not with this, you know, why even have it on the book, so to speak? Thank you. Well, I'll jump in and sort of try to answer it in connection with um, Milena's question about investigation and sort of all the other the other things that were said. And others can, of course, jump in. I, I think absolutely, if the evidence is there, one would... Um, one would bring these charges. And so, but I will raise, um, even though the crimes are happening right now, prosecutors or and investigators seeking to um, you know build this beyond a reasonable doubt case can have some difficulties one because the conflict is ongoing right that sometimes makes it difficult to gather evidence in certain places or to find witnesses now technology has made this a little easier I think than than it might have been before I, I think people are sending videos and satellites and all sorts of there there are ways to get evidence there are even ways to get testimony from witnesses now online, right? We can, we can talk to people even if we might not be able to go into territory. So these are all new developments that I think make investigations 
perhaps easier, even though we are in the conflict. I will say that there's the possibility that, well, there's some evidence that we can obtain. And, and I think Nadia points that out. There, Putin has made statements. This, this person um, who is, is helping with the um, adoptions has made statements. There are statements. Um, so those statements can be very helpful. There may be some witnesses though that we cannot reach um, because they are in Russia um, right now or may remain in Russia. There are also some um, defendants who we may not, or suspects who we may not be able to obtain custody over um, because they are in Russia or some other place that is um, hostile to prosecutorial efforts. Um, and I think that those are concerns as well. One can bring a case in absentia with, without the presence of the defendant, and that is permitted, I understand, um, under Ukrainian law, and someone can correct me if I am incorrect. Um, it is also permitted by the ICC, um, and I think the ICC is beginning an uh, in absentia uh, prosecution right now of Joseph Kony. Um, but sometimes these in absentia um, trials um, may not, you know, they have various, there are various critiques of them, but they also may not give the victims um, what the victims always want. I'll turn it to Stephen because I see he has something to add. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can speak to the in absentia thing for a moment, but then just to go back to the genocide point as well. I mean, we, we just saw the MH17 verdict uh, in, the, in the Dutch system where two Russians and one Donetsky uh, were convicted. Of, of the shooting down of MH17. It was in the Dutch court because the, the case was developed as a joint investigative team. Uh, I remember uh, helping set that up in their unit in, in Kiev in 2014. Uh, but the the uh, if, you, if you recall, that Malaysian aircraft, more, majority of the passengers were, were young uh, Netherlands citizens. Uh, and they couldn't get uh, a, a, an international tribunal. The Russians said they would veto it. And so they did a national case and did it in absentia and, and rendered the judgment here about two months ago. Uh, Convicted three, acquitted one, uh, and I and the victims I thought respected the process, but uh, it wasn't as as valuable as one where the defendants had been in custody and where you could have faced uh, the, uh, you know uh, the victims would have had the opportunity to face the people that were responsible or allegedly responsible for these crimes, and in the international tribunals uh, we've had like, since Nuremberg a requirement uh, at least those that have dealt with atrocity crimes. Uh, that they'd be uh, in personam cases. And people said, well, you're never going to get these people. You won't get Milosevic. Uh, you won't get Taylor. But eventually, using a political leverage, uh, we were able to, to do that. And, and indeed, uh, even with Russia, there will come a time when, you know, 300 billion in sovereign assets, uh, rejoining the international system, et cetera, uh, may be an incentive like it was for Serbia uh, to, uh, to comply, uh, even though there was political strong arguments against compliance. And so it could happen, and, and people like uh, uh, Putin could be pushed aside, maybe not by perfect individuals, but by others that would see the advantage of turning them in. And so I think most of us would like to see in, in personam cases. But uh, when we do the aggression tribunal, if we do an aggression tribunal, there will be that issue. Uh, the ICC can't do uh, in absentia. It does now have the ability to confirm an indictment in absentia, and they're gonna do that on Coney, of course, who they indicted more than a dozen years ago and is still uh, hiding out, and they can actually have a proceeding with victims and others to confirm the indictment, something that normally doesn't happen at the ICC until an arrest. And potentially they could do the same thing if they charge Putin. They could have one of these in absentia confirmation hearings, and you'd hear all of the evidence that could go on for several weeks, but it would only be to confirm the indictment for the trial. You would need to, uh, uh, to come along with the, uh, uh, with, uh, with the defendant uh, uh, in person. Uh, just in just in terms of genocide, I mean, I, I uh, this question of we had this issue with the, at the uh, you know not genocide but of duplicate charges with the special court for Sierra Leone, and my attitude was well you know we've got the judges dressed up and they're ready to rule on these issues and we've got legal issues to make and I've got a provable case I will charge uh, uh, the, ca the, the the cases that I can now we actually slimmed down the Taylor indictment and left out some things but we made sure that we had the acts of murder and rape and mutilation and and uh, uh, and other things charged both as war crimes and crimes against humanity. In the end, we succeeded and we ended up with 11 counts of conviction, both for war crimes and crimes against humanity, different elements for each, uh, but uh, uh, basically on the same proof. And I think that would be an argument for potentially doing genocide, even though that would present, I think, more complex legal issues and defenses and everything else uh, 
if if uh, if there's a provable case, uh, I'd say it, it needs to go forward, and it doesn't necessarily add too much uh, to the to the case, which involves these these acts, which uh, at least in the case of, of the gen of, of the of the children, are all the same thing. I would note, by the way, that, that there are genocide charges that have been filed in absentia. Uh, or at least uh, cases that have been announced uh, in the Ukrainian system for incitement to genocide. Uh, some individuals who were propagandists, who were saying these horrible things, et cetera, uh, publicly have been charged with incitement. Uh, uh, now, they may, those cases may proceed against uh, those individuals in, in, in absentia. Incitement is an interesting case. I prosecuted the media in Rwanda. Incitement, you don't actually have to prove that it caused the genocide. You only have to prove that they had the intent to do it and that the, the audience understood their message uh, and that there was a danger that the audience would follow their message, et cetera. So uh, there can be charges like the attempt uh, uh, charge that was also mentioned by Michael that could allow you to go forward on, on, on genocide uh, without having to prove that one was accomplished. Greg, did you want to weigh in as well? Yeah, I, I did. And that is your concern is, 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 is spot on. Um, these core international crimes are incredibly important. We know that historically, and that's part of what we need to focus on. We're, we're not going to be 100% satisfied with the justice that is meted out at the end of this. Justice is never perfect. We never get all the people in the dock that we want to get in the dock. Personally, I believe Vladimir Putin will never be in a courtroom ever. But there is strength in having these conversations for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, I think it's a deterrence because the people we're more likely to get are those field grade officers from major to colonel, brigadier general, who are on the field, who, who are, excuse me, in the field and they're directing uh, combat. And if they know that there is a conversation going on, that we could be coming for you, that when you go to take your children on holiday to Croatia in, in, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, your name's on a list. That's incredibly important. And, and, uh, and another thing we need to understand about this is this is going to take a long time. We're, we're, we're doing the residual mechanism, we, the, the royal we, doing the residual mechanism in The Hague uh, on Rwanda and Yugoslavia. And we're 30 plus years removed. Um, and, and so this is going to take decades. The second point I want to make, and then and I'll stop because I know we're short on time, is the historical record that you create. Having these tribunals, having these investigations that may or may not lead to a prosecution are incredibly important for the historical record. We know at the end of World War II, and even to today, there are people still denying the Holocaust. We knew in Rwanda that there are people almost immediately saying, ah, that many people didn't die. And so we need to create that historical record. And uh, I, I, historians are great, but lawyers doing investigations with, along with investigators and, and, and trained professionals, that really helps create the historical record. So nobody can come back later and say, oh, well, Putin, he wasn't all. No, he was. I believe he committed genocide. He certainly committed crimes against humanity. And he's a war criminal. And the Russian military is full of war criminals. And that's a historical record that we need to nail down to make sure that we leave no doubt. Absolutely. Thank you. For Thank, that. Thank you. Now, one last question to our panelists, because we are running out of time. Um, and there's so many excellent questions that have come through the Q&A. And I apologize to those of you if we don't get to your questions. But um, what about prosecuting? Um, you know, there are two different questions. But what about prosecuting Russian parents? of the adopted children? Could you prosecute them? And then another a very, very, very interesting question. And then another uh, question, you know, somewhat similar, could you prosecute some of the Wagner group members, you know, the mercenaries for any of these um, core international crimes? Well, I'll take the easy one. Yes, mercenaries, first of all, being a mercenary is illegal under international law. And they're held, if they're out of the battlefield and they're committing these crimes, then they absolutely could be prosecuted uh, just as well. And I think maybe maybe on the parents, maybe you'd have to look at modes of liability, such as, you know, complicity to commit genocide, if we're talking about genocide, um, you know, uh, so, so, sort of not, so not, not direct participation, but sort of, you know, different modes of liability. That, that would be my take on that. Um, 
Okay, well, we are almost out of time. I did want to leave time for Nadia to give some closing remarks. And before I turn over to turn the floor over to her, I did want to thank our panelists for participating today and for all their excellent insights. Thank you so much. Nadia, the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you, Ivana. I cannot express enough appreciation for uh, pulling this panel together and really uh, giving us this very rich, uh, in-depth discussion and understanding of the challenges that all of this presents. But also you've given us, I think, a roadmap uh, to uh, you know all work together. Um, so uh, you know some of our next webinars, perhaps the next one should be on some of these uh, organizations that have tried to re have rescued children. And I just actually saw a video interview earlier this morning of a child that had been returned and he talked about what had taken place. So we will share that with our audience. Um, again, this was the perfect first uh, F, you know, webinar to have on our campaign. And uh, Milana, I would just also, uh, the last few minutes, maybe have let each panelist maybe have a closing remark that they would like to make. But again, thank you all so very much. Thank you. And, and I would just actually, if I can, you know, just build on that question, um, I would just like to invite our panelists to give just a few thoughts on basically options for prosecuting Russian leaders. What are what are we looking at now? What are some of the best options for imposing accountability uh, on at least some of Russian leaders for, for the acts that they um, ordered to be committed in Ukraine? So let me start, Stephen, let me start with you. Yeah, we want to support the Ukrainian authorities in, in building strong cases there. They have primary jurisdiction. Uh, of course, the general prosecutor, I'm not, I'm not sure the figure is now 60,000, but it mounts every day that the number of sort of open war crimes uh, files that they have they have opened, and they need uh, a great assistance on that. Uh, beyond that, of course, uh, the ICC is very important. Please, the U.S. Uh, Congress passed legislation at the end of December that allows the U.S. to provide really robust assistance to the ICC on the uh, on this case, an exception to the law that otherwise applies. And, and, and uh, you know, the ICC, I think, has, uh, at one point was, I think, sending uh, 42 or so investigators in. I know our friend Vendor Hollis, who's leading the uh, supervising the prosecution effort for Prosecutor Karim Khan, has, I think, 15 investigators working. I mean, it's, a, it's not big enough. <laughs> they need a lot more resources and a lot more assistance to develop these cases. And then finally, I think we need this, uh, this International Tribunal on, on Aggression. If we don't enforce that norm here, uh, when will we ever uh, enforce it? Uh, keeping in mind that the genocide is also important, but that's something the ICC can do. Uh, nobody can do uh, the aggression of the senior leaders uh, uh, in any court uh, in the world and without creating a new one. And I think we need to do it. Michael? So what I think is different about this conflict, and it's really unique, and it gives me some optimism, is that the Ukraine government has brilliantly been using legitimate lawfare. And by that, I mean, they have a sophisticated understanding about how to use the International Criminal Court how to get international assistance for their own domestic prosecutions, how to use the United Nations process and the European Union process to perhaps get an ad hoc tribunal. And the one thing they have to avoid at all costs is an accidental or um, just any kind of commission of crimes on their side. And, and to draw a little analogy about what's going on in US politics, for example, there was this major case being built against former President Trump for having all these confidential documents. And when a couple of documents showed up in President Biden's house, it suddenly became moral equivalency and it muddled the case and it may have destroyed the case. And that's what the Ukraine government has to avoid if it, if it can at all costs. Yeah, and I don't have much to add other than I agree that um... Supporting Ukraine um, is the way that we have to act um, as we go forward. And I think um, that seems to be what the effort is right now. And I hope that that um, continues. I'm sure Greg agrees with you, Yvonne. Right, Greg? <laughs> yes, he does. Thank you so much, Nadia, um, 
for and you know from our from our and from uh, the public international law and policy group it's been such a pleasure working with you to organize this web webinar thank you again to all of our panelists and thank you to all of our audience members for joining us today thank you all right.